everyone. My name is Maria Thomas, and I work for Allianz Research, the global team of economists, strategists, sector advisors, and foresight experts of the Allianz Group, led by Ludovic Subron. Welcome to Tomorrow, a podcast where we'll be talking about our latest analyses of economic and capital market developments, as well as our views on trends affecting risk management. Let's get started. In the 25 years since the foundation of the euro, the economic gap between the US and eurozone has almost tripled. What explains this widening gap and how can Europe regain its competitive edge? We find out in this episode with senior economists Bjorn Griesbeck and Jasmine Groschel from Allianz Research. Hello, Jasmine and Bjorn. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Maria. Hello, Maria. So you write in your report that the economic gap between the U.S. and Eurozone has tripled since the euro was founded 25 years ago. What explains this widening gap? Yes, uh, so the economic gap in, between the Eurozone and the U.S. has indeed widened on almost every metric you can look at. So if you take 1999, when the euro was founded, introduced, uh, the U.S. economy was about 11% larger than the Eurozone, uh, if you compare them on purchasing power parity. And then after several major crises that have admittedly hit Europe more strongly than the U.S., the Euro, Euro crisis, Euro debt crisis, for example, but also the last COVID crisis and the following uh, Ukraine-Russian war. Uh, so after these crises, this gap has widened to 30% in 2022, so has almost tripled. And as I said, this winding gap is also visible on many other metrics. If you take, for example... Uh, a look at how much American companies are worth compared to European ones. Like if you compare the market capitalization of the S&P 500 and the stocks Europe 600. So you compare basically the 500 largest companies of the US with a similar amount, the 600 largest companies of Europe. The valuation, I like what those were worth in 2008, it was roughly 10 trillion on both sides. So they were roughly the same. Today, fast forward, uh, a couple of uh, years, and the Eurostock 600 in US dollar has barely changed in value. Also, this is also due to the weakening euro, of course, but the S&P 500 has reached in the, in the meantime a valuation of 40 trillion, so it has quadrupled. So you're quite, ask, quite right to ask uh, what has caused this widening gap. And here we emphasize that it's not only those economic crises that I just mentioned, but it's also on a more structural level. So the US has really quite a few structural privileges compared to the Eurozone. What are these structural privileges exactly? Well, to start with, demographics is the most probably the most important one. So the US has more favorable demographics when it comes to economic growth. We calculate that over the last decades, uh, the US has about one percentage point more growth every year compared to the, U- to the Eurozone. And of this one percentage point, 0.6 percentage points, so roughly 60% of this excess growth comes from a faster growing working uh, age population. But that still means that 40% of the growth outperformance comes from other sources. And what are those? In our paper, we at least at least three. Uh, the first one being lower energy costs, better funding capabilities for investment, and third, a strong human capital thanks to R&D. So if I may just quickly elaborate on these three. So the energy cost advantage, if you look at electricity bills, for example, they have been around 30 to 60% cheaper in the US compared to the Eurozone for a long time already. And this gap has now just widened since 2021, since uh, due to the Russia-Ukraine war, gas prices have spiked and electricity prices have spiked in in, uh, Europe. Then the second point, which I mentioned, funding. So the US has lower funding costs relative to its growth rate, thanks to a much larger and more integrated financial market. So, and also, very important, the US has a more mature venture capital market, which enables it to finance startups. And the outcome of this, we can see um, in the tech sector, where the US has now a huge head start against the eurozone so the magnificent seven those seven companies which are all over the news apple microsoft amazon and and co they are all u.s companies no european one in it, in it and this is also brings me to the third point one reason for that being that the u.s has a strong advantage in terms of research and development the u.s has recently overtook germany in r&d expenditure in percent of gdp and it has always been higher than the other major economies france italy spain 
So this is another reason why it's not surprising that the largest and most innovative companies are U.S. companies. So those are the structural privileges of the U.S. And what about the Eurozone? What would you say is holding back growth on the other side of the Atlantic? Yeah, so um, actually the Eurozone has seen disappointing productivity growth. And um, this is mainly in comparison to the U.S. because of labor productivity. So um, U.S. labor productivity, for example, grew 0.8 percentage points faster every year than the Eurozone productivity. And this is actually a huge gap, right? So the divergence between the U.S. and the Eurozone's income per capita mainly stems from this gap in labor productivity. This is actually surprising in the end because the European countries um, have been further away from the technological frontier and therefore have in principle um, more product, uh, yeah, productivity to catch up um, in this potential. So, um, yeah, uh, labor productivity is definitely um, a, a point that holds back the eurozone. And on the other hand, um, the Euro, uh, EU economies actually invest too little in new capacity, right? So the growth rate of technological process and efficiency is really underwhelming in the EU. Then there is the business environment. So for the US, it's really more friendly um, to, to businesses, while overregulation really impedes innovation in the eurozone. So the rules that we have in the eurozone really make it harder to do business than in the US. It's harder to get credit in the EU, um, startups struggle in particular, and also navigating um, the eurozone country um, separate laws and tax rules really holds back innovation and companies um, overall. But we shouldn't forget that obviously the U.S. also have 50 different states and they also, um, you know, like the regulations across these different states can also trip up business. But they have a lighter approach um, to regulation that leaves more room uh, for innovation in the end. One last point is that the Eurozone also has a large exposure to macro shocks, to sovereign risks and to over-reliance on bank funding, which actually also hampers uh, the European Union. So this larger volatility actually creates more uncertainty. It also um, has tighter funding conditions for European corporates. And in the end, it basically hinders innovation. You mentioned in the report that there is a green silver lining. Yes. So um, one thing that Europe struggles with is still like uh, the higher energy cost. The U.S. has um, cheaper energy, um, which actually in the end comes at an environmental cost. So uh, the Eurozone basically produces uh, much lower CO2 emissions per capita. So the growth in the U.S. and, you know, like this uh, push also in labor productivity and everything really has a substantial env environmental price uh, where Europe is actually doing much better. So compared, the average U.S. citizen still generates nearly three times the annual CO2 emissions of a European um, so this basically creates this environmental gap where Europe is much better uh, in basically reducing CO2 emissions. One thing to, to, uh, that's really interesting is that if everyone would consume the same amount of natural resources as the Americans do, it would require 5.1 planets. While, for example, looking at Germany, it would require the equivalent of three planets or for the UK, 2.6. So Europe is really doing better in this, you know, like reducing emissions, uh, making life uh, or making their contribution to, to climate change there. And there is another point where Europe is doing uh, much better. Um, and we called it like the green window of opportunity. So um, basically, um, the EU clearly has taken the lead in producing green goods trade. So, for example, Germany uh, surpassed uh, U.S. in green exports um, uh, for a strong mile, um, while the U.S. has become the strongest importer of green um, technologies and goods. So 19 out of the 27 EU economies actually show a comparative advantage in 2021 in producing green technologies and green goods, which, which will actually help to, um, yeah, um, uh, combat climate change. Uh, on the other hand, the US is actually slowly losing market share and um, its comparative advantage in these green technologies has actually deteriorated over time. Um, the good thing for Europe or the good news is that, you know, like this advantage in uh, creating green technologies and green goods is actually that this will actually boost jobs or green jobs in the end uh, with the green transformation. This will come over the years and this can actually absorb um, some of the workforce that was displaced by potential deindustrialization in the declining sectors in the end. So 
Europe can actually tap even further into growing these global markets for clean technologies and actually trying to push itself out of um, this gap between, you know, like what they lost against uh, other countries, basically, but producing and exporting more of these environmental goods. So, um, Yet still, you know, like we still have the challenge of um, green energy production in the EU, where we really struggle with uh, getting comparative uh, disadvantages away. So what does all this mean for policymakers in Europe? How can Europe regain its competitive edge? So um, the European countries really urgently need to tackle some of the obstacles, for example, of higher productivity growth. Um, they really need to regain their competitive edge and they need to, need to ensure the sustainability of their public finances in the end. So for us, the top priorities must actually include to reduce red tape and some overregulation that we see in within the EU, but also within uh, the, the different countries, from the labor market um, to the business environment, really simplifying these rules and taxes across uh, Europe would really help strengthen uh, the internal market there a lot. Then the second point we have is that, you know, like achieving a common uh, monetary union uh, in uh, within uh, the Eurozone will actually require this political will to overcome the resistance of these uh, vested interests between European countries and really to create a vision of tru a truly integrated European financial union, which actually in the end would require a well-functioning banking union and a vibrant um, currency uh, or, or, um, monetary union uh, with a healthy competition. And uh, the third thing is that we really need more targeted subsidies towards pushing the trans train transformation within uh, the EU forward to really have a European industrial policy, which doesn't you know, like allow the countries to invest a lot in their own economy, but then create competition between European economies, but rather have a common strategy and um, use the comparative advantages of each country in the European Union there um, to actually rise to our potentials there. But I think Bjorn maybe wants to add something to what Europe has to do to overcome the challenges. Thanks, Jasmine. I mean, not much. The thing I wanted to add is, uh, despite all the drawbacks that uh, Europe has compared to the US, I think we should also not forget, and we also emphasize that in the paper, that there are a couple of metrics where Europe outperforms the US. You mentioned already the CO2 emissions and the whole environmental footprint, which is better in Europe. Uh, I might add here the life expectancy is an important long-term metric, and this is higher in the uh, in Europe and has this gap between the US and Europe has actually widened. So that is another positive thing. And then third, income and wealth is much more evenly distributed compared to the US, which leads to a less polarized society um, at the moment. So these are some positive aspects for the Eurozone. And I would just emphasize that whatever policymakers do to regain competitiveness in these other fields that we mentioned earlier, it should definitely not come at the cost of those things where Europe already has a head start compared to the US. Thank you, Jasmine and Bjorn. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. You can find the full report we just spoke about on our website. We'll leave a link in the show notes. If you'd like to discover more of our research, you can also follow the Ludonomics newsletter on LinkedIn. We'll leave a link down below for that too. If you like the podcast, please send it to any of your friends who might like it too, and leave us a rating and a review. We'd love to hear your feedback. In the meantime, stay tuned for the next episode.